you have your Bibles, I want to invite you with me. We're going to find ourselves in the book of Amos, the book of Amos, specifically chapters 4 and 5 this morning. Amos is going to highlight for us the righteous unrighteous. And our big takeaway, if you take one thing away from the message, if someone asks ask you one question, what was the sermon about on Sunday? What did you learn Sunday? You can tell them this. A just life relies on the righteousness of Christ and not the righteousness of good works. A just life, a life that is considered just, a person that is considered just, made right with God, relies on the righteousness of Christ and not the righteousness of good works. So oftentimes we think we try, we put ourselves in a position where we think our good works are going to earn us the favor of, of God, that we can look at our lives, we see this, this pile of negativity, this pile of sin, this pile of shame, this pile of guilt that's rightfully ours. And we think we can offset this by doing enough good works. I remember when I was a freshman in high school and we had a fall of sports banquet and um, all the, everybody got awards and everything. Brad didn't get no awards. Brad was garbage. He didn't get nothing. And I remember I was sitting on the breezeway outside of the gym and, and the head football coach was uh, across from me, and I said, uh, I said, I'm going to get me some awards next year. He said, you will never win an award. Never. I was like, that's all I needed. That's it. That's it. Let me tell you what happened. The next year, uh, I was all district offense and defense in football. And I remember I took those awards to him. And like in my head, the whole year, those words inspired. They, they were like vitriol. They were like gas in my soul to inspire me to to outwork anything, to gain his praise, because he didn't respect me. He didn't think I could. So I wanted to do everything I could to take these things. I worked as hard. I mean, I sweat as hard. I, I did everything I could, and I brought these to him, and he didn't care. He never said, good job. He never said, good hard work. He never said, you earned it, you deserved it. And see, a lot of us think, a lot of us think that we can take a pile of good works all of our sweat, all of our tears, everything we have, and we can present it to God in this nice package and say, look, look what I've gotten for you. And he's going to say it's not good enough. It can never be good enough because there's only one good enough, and that is Jesus Christ. His righteousness and his righteousness alone covering us is what makes us right before God. There's nothing that you and I can do to make ourselves right before God. And that's really the crux of what Amos is going to talk about today. You see, the book of Amos is really laid out in, in uh, several sections. You have uh, some oracles, you have some sermons, you have some visions, and you have some promises at the very end. And what I love about this book of Amos is Amos is just a good old boy from Jefferson County. He really is. If you, 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 you read where he's from, he's from Takiya, and, and that's a little nothing town. Uh, in the south, he, he's, not even, he, he's, he's a herdsman. He is a fig picker. That's what he does. He harvests figs out of his fig tree, and he herds cattle and sheep. He, he doesn't have no education. He doesn't have no seminary degree. He is just a regular person. And what I love about Amos is he shows us you don't have to have everything together to be used and called by God. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to have a certain status. You don't have to have a certain bank account. You don't have to have a certain zip code. God can call any one of you and has called you to go and serve and be a mouthpiece for him. What's interesting about this book of Amos is Amos starts off in the first chapter and he judges six Gentile nations, six of Israel's enemies. Could you imagine if you're Israel? Could you think about that? He's judging, he's throwing judgment out to, to, to people who don't like you, who you don't like. And you got to feel pretty good about it. Yeah, Amos, get them. Get them. Tell them about themselves, Amos. Get up on them, Amos. Tell them how God's going to get them. And Amos, he's walking this way and he turns and says, well, now Judah and Israel, it's your turn. And this is during the reign of Jeroboam II. So we're going to back about 200 years from where we have been of talking about the exile, the Babylonian exile. This is about 200 years before that. All right, so back up just a little bit. And this is the height of prosperity and religiosity and the height of, of just glamour and glitz in Israel. Everybody thought that they were good. Everybody thought that they were going to be okay. Everybody thought that what they were doing was exactly what God wanted them to do. They were being there, if you heard this phrase today, their true selves. 
right? But Amos has a word for him. He says, the righteousness which you think you have doesn't belong to you because you're not trusting in God. Father God, as we turn our attention to your word this morning, Lord, would you fill our hearts and show us that we should not, cannot, must not rely on our righteousness, God, but we have to, we must. It is dependent upon our salvation to rely on the righteousness that you have provided us in your Son, Jesus. Father, may we know this, may we understand this, may we cling to this today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The first thing I want you to see is in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4. And this is what I want you to understand, is that when we rely on our works to determine our righteousness, when you and I, when we rely on our works to determine our righteousness, we may experience some temporary satisfaction, we may enjoy it a little bit, but we're leading ourselves to judgment if we're trusting in our works to justify ourselves before a holy and righteous God. Let's look at the text this morning, starting in verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria. Wow, he, he hit him right out the gate, didn't he? I mean, how would you feel if I called you cows this morning? This is what he's doing. He's talking to the religious elite right now. This is what he's talking to people who think they're right with God right now. He's talking to the people who are in church right now. That's what he's doing in his culture, in his context. He's talking to people that come to worship on a regular basis, you see. Who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring now that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness. Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. He's talking about the Assyrians and the Babylonians. They would take them off. They literally would put hooks in their nose and, and, and drag them from one place to the next. You will go out through breaches in the wall, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to Harmon, declares the Lord. Enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. These are the holy places, the holy sites, Bethel and Gilgal. You're coming to worship, he says, but you're bringing sin upon yourself. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. I like that part. Offer a thank offering also from that which is leavened. And proclaim free will offerings. Make them known. For so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord. But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. God says, I'm going to make it where your mouths don't have nothing to eat. Your teeth are going to be clean because you had not tasted food in a long time. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Furthermore, I will withhold the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. So God is laying judgment before them. He's telling them their righteousness, their works are not doing it. They're trying to be religious. They're coming to church. They're doing what they're doing. But notice what God calls them. Notice what the text says. Notice what Amos says. He says, you come to this mountain. You worship at Bethel. You worship at Gilgal. You say to your husbands, bring so we can drink. We want to have a good time. We want to do everything. But notice what the text says in verse 1. You oppress the poor and you crush the needy. He says, you're acting all religious. You're doing all the things that, that make you look good to each other. But you're not actually doing the one thing I've told you to do. Care for those around you. Take care of the poor. See what happened, the, the rich and the elite. Uh, then there's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. But what they were doing, they were using their wealth to oppress the poor, to steal from those who already didn't have. They would put them in debtor's prison after intentionally, after intentionally roping them into like these loan shark type loans, right? And there's three specific sins that God calls out here in verses 1 through 6. He says you're guilty of luxury, you're guilty of hypocrisy, and you're guilty of defiance. Luxury, hypocrisy, and defiance. We see luxury in verses 1 through 3. He says, you come and you do this. You want to drink. You want to do all these things. You, you, you want to have all this goodness. You say, what's wrong with luxury? You may ask the question, what's wrong with luxury? 
This is the biblical issue with luxury. When we allow possessions to own us, we are not allowing the gifts of God to be used for the glory of God. See, God had, had made them very wealthy. This was the height of their wealth in the country. They had everything they needed and more. Everything they could want and more. Yet they still were using it to gather more and more. And they did nothing for the people that had nothing. They took advantage of them. They oppressed them. They, they didn't look out for them. They didn't protect them. They did not only not protect them, they took advantage of them. They imprisoned them. They made them slaves. And God says, because of that, I'm going to oppress you. I'm going to make you poor. I'm going to enslave you just as you are doing to those individuals around you. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 19, verses 23 and 24, he says, it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than it is for a camel to get through the eye of the needle. You say, well, why is that? And we talked about this several uh, months ago, actually last year, and we talked about wealth. Nothing wrong being wealthy, but the problem is for a lot of us who, who find themselves wealthy, and, if, and I don't know if you know this, but in this country you're considered wealthy if you live in America, no matter what your status is in the world. But the problem is, is individuals begin to rely on that wealth as their safety net. They trust in that wealth. They trust in the ability to gain that wealth instead of trusting in God. And this is exactly what was taking place here. They were committing the sin of luxury. They were relying on the gifts instead of relying on those gifts to be used for God's glory. He said, you're guilty of luxury, but you're also guilty of hypocrisy. Look at verses 4 and 5. He says, enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering from that which is leavened. Proclaim free will offerings. Make them known, for so you love to do. Notice what he says. He catches them right here. They're feeling pretty good about themselves. Yeah, I do that. I bring that offering. We come to worship at Bethel. We come to worship at Gilgal. He says, oh, you love to do that. You love to show off to each other. Listen to what James chapter 4, verse 8 says. I'll get there eventually. He says, clear your heads, you double-minded. Notice that. He calls them double-minded. Hmm. He says, don't be double-minded. I'm sorry, I said chapter 4, I meant chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 8. He says, you're double-minded, you're unstable in all your ways. What is James saying? He says the same thing Amos is saying. You're double-minded, you're a hypocrite in what you do. You're pretending to come worship, you're pretending to come do these things, but you're not taking the worship that you bring in, you're not taking it out into the world to live with you. Amos says, you're, you're hypocrites. Now, one of the things we hear all the time, I know you've probably heard it, I don't want to go to that church because they're filled with a bunch of what? We get mad when people say that about our church. If you've ever been in a church, you get defensive about your church, right? Don't you? Let's be honest. I get defensive about that. But I always have to ask, is that warranted? When our people leave this house, when they leave this place of gathering, when we go out as sent ones into a lost and dying world, are we going out as disciples, bringing the light of Christ, realizing we have nothing to offer anyone, going out as humble, going out as gentle, going out as peaceful, going out as kind, going out as gospel? Are we going out there like that, or are we only that way in here? Because see, this is what Amos says. If you're only that way in here... He says, you're a hypocrite. If you're only about being a disciple here, then you're not really a disciple at all. That's a gut punch, isn't it? Amos says, if you're not actually living out there, it doesn't matter how much you give. If you're not serving out there, it, do, it, it do, doesn't matter how many offerings you bring. If, if, if you're not actually loving people out there that are your enemies out there, it doesn't matter how much you come and lift your hands inside the house of God. Beloved, we must not, we cannot afford to be a people who are plagued by hypocrisy. You say, well, how do I avoid hypocrisy? I think this is a fair question for us all. 
How can I be a man? How can I be a woman? How can I be a young person who avoids hypocrisy? Simply just don't be double-minded. Don't be unstable in all your ways. Focus on Christ and Christ alone. Don't worry about what crowd you're in. Don't worry about what you're doing. Don't worry about what you're not doing. Focus on Christ and what He is doing in you. In here will be the same thing He's doing in you out there. And so that when you and I come in here, we're coming in here with clean hearts. Ready to worship God because we've been living with clean hearts out there. So many times we view church with this misconception. We view that we're out in the world being made dirty and you come in here and you're being made clean. But Jesus said, you've already been made clean because of the word which I have spoken unto you. You don't have to come to church to get clean. You come to church to gather with your brothers and sisters and exalt Jesus Christ. Be equipped in the word so you can go out and engage the lost world. Beloved, we cannot afford to be hypocrites. We have to be men and women who are daily before the throne of God following after God, hearing God's word, walking with Christ. Amos says you're guilty of luxury, you're guilty of hypocrisy, and he also says you're guilty of defiance. Look at verse 6. He says, I've given you cleanliness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. He says, I basically caused a famine to come across the land. I've I've put you to the point of starvation. But notice what he says at the end of verse 6. Yet you have not returned to me. Beloved, when we continue to defy God's warnings and corrections, we build up the wrath of God for ourselves. God is telling them through Amos, he says, look, I, I, I am trying to get your attention because this road you are going down is a road you cannot afford to go down. I've been trying to do everything I can to grab a hold of you, but you're not listening. Jesus kind of says some of the same thing in Matthew chapter 11. Listen to what he says. Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 and 21. Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sodom, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. God's trying to give them grace. He's trying to correct them Jesus was going to these cities to to preach the good news of the gospel. And what was the good news right then? The same message John the Baptist was preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was going to those cities, letting them know that, hey, I am here. I'm telling you what's coming. You want to avoid the judgment. It's going to be bad. I'm here. But guess what? They didn't turn, Jesus says. And they were going to receive a worse judgment than the cities in the Old Testament because they didn't have the knowledge of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. He says, you're going to be judged more because of the knowledge that you do have now than those without the knowledge. Beloved, some of us here may be going through some situations, and and I would never attempt to put the rationale for why you're in the situation you're in, why you're experiencing the circumstance, why you're experiencing the heartache, why you're experiencing the health problem. I would never, ever attempt to do that. But the Bible tells us that for some of us, Some of the things, some of the circumstances, some of the situations in our lives are caused because of unrepentant sin. And God is placing judgment upon us, judgment upon many of us, to get our attention, to turn us back to Jesus Christ so that we may not have to experience further judgment. And you may be here this morning, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and and you're sitting here and you're saying, well, my life is in shambles. And maybe, just maybe, and, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would never attempt to do that. But maybe God is trying to get your attention to bring you to a position in life where you can see you have nothing without Christ. And he's trying to judge you lightly now so you don't have to experience eternal judgment later. But the problem with Israel here as Amos was going to talk to them is that God was trying to get their attention but they were defiant. I, I, and I can tell you, you anybody who's had kids, you, you've had a defiant kid, right? You know what that's like. Hey, do this. No. I'm not going to do that. Every time 
Jace is eating something. He wants Frank's hot sauce. It's his favorite hot sauce in the world. That's the only hot sauce that exists. I buy him all kinds of other hot sauces to try. Well, the other day, he, he made, Kristen made some tacos, and, and Jace, he, he, he puts it on every bite. I mean, he loads it up. He loads the whole taco up, then everybody puts some more hot sauce on there. He is from the South. You know that. Why would you say that? And the other day, I bought some hot sauce when we were in New Orleans, and it was some, some hypernero sauce. It was really good. And uh, he puts it, I mean, he lied, but he didn't taste it. He just layers this top. I mean, it's like swimming in this sauce. He goes, he goes, oh, I don't like it. I'm not eating. I said, boy, you, you eating that taco? He said, I can get another one. I said, son, we, we, we borderline poor around here. We don't throw away food. We eat that food. And he just sits there until it gets cold. He goes, I don't want to eat it because it's cold. I said, son, you about, you, you're about to get fed that food. <laughs> you don't eat it. And he'll, Jace will just sit there, steely-eyed and steely heart, just, just glare at you. You've seen it, Miss Catherine. You, you know what Kristen deals with, right? What happens? Jace ends up getting a tune-up, and he don't like it. So many of us, God in this room right now, I want you to think about this situation in your life. God may be trying to get your attention right now, and you've been defying him, not listening to him. And he says, hey, come, <laughs> turn. I don't, I don't want to judge. That's not my goal is to judge. My goal, my aim, my, 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 my chief purpose is to show you this grace. It's the reason my son came and died for you, so I can show you this grace. Don't defy the grace. But then we skip over to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, Amos shows us the antidote for works-based righteousness is trusting and surrendering to the righteousness of God. And if we connect this to the New Testament, we would say the righteousness of Christ. Look at chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word which I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel. She has fallen, she will not rise again, the virgin Israel. She lies neglected on her land. There is none to raise her up, for thus says the Lord God. The city which goes forth a thousand strong will have a hundred left. And the one which goes forth a hundred strong will have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live, but do not resort to Bethel and do not come to Gilgal. Nor cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity, and Bethel will come to trouble. Seek the Lord that you may live, or he will break forth like a fire, O house of Joseph, and it will consume with none to quench it for Bethel. Skip down to verse 14. Seek good and not evil that you may live, and thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you, just as you have said. The antidote for workspace righteousness is trusting and surrendering to the righteousness of God. And you say, what does it look like to seek the righteousness of Christ? What does it look like to seek the righteousness of God? Amos gives us three ways that you and I seek after the righteousness of Christ. He says we hear the word. We have to hear the Savior. Hear the call of the Savior. Listen to what he says in, in the verse, first verse. And you hear this over and over through this book of his. But he says this in chapter 5 and verse 1. He says, hear the word. Hear the word. Beloved, if you want to be righteous with God, you first have to hear the word. You say, why is the word important? Because the word is life. It's the gospel. It's how we know about Jesus Christ. Paul, writing to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 13, he says, you heard the word of the gospel. You believed the word of the gospel. You were filled with the Holy Spirit. When we hear the word, we hear the gospel, we respond to the gospel. God fills us with his spirit and seals us, and we are given the righteousness of Christ when we hear the word. Beloved, one of the saddest things in, in, in the church today is the amount of biblical illiteracy that is running rampant. I'm just going to be honest with you. Most of us don't understand our Bibles because if we're just going to open the curtains today, let's just put the cards on the table. Most people don't understand their Bibles because most people don't read their Bibles. I've yet to meet a person, I've yet to meet a person that rarely tells me they don't understand their Bible, but they continually regularly read it. The more you read, 
the more you will understand, the more you will see, the more you will hear, the more you will know the glory this gospel of Jesus Christ is for you. The more the righteousness of Christ will be evident to you, what's been given to you. Beloved, I want to challenge you. Be a man, be a woman, be a young person that invests in hearing and listening and reading and meditating on the Word of God. In Joshua chapter 1, as Joshua is taking over from Moses, leading the people into the promised land, one of the things that God gives to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, he says, Be strong and courageous, Joshua. He says, he says, hear my word. He says, read my word. He says, do not turn to the right or to the left on it, that you shall have success wherever you go. Meditate on my word day and night that you shall not fall. Beloved, if we want to be made right with God, we have to hear the words of the Savior. When Jesus is fighting and he's in this battle with Satan in, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. Satan tries to tempt him. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4? He says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Beloved, live on the word of God. The second thing Amos tells us, and we see this in verses 4 through 6, is seek the Savior. Listen to what he says. He says in verse 6, Seek the Lord that you may live. Seek the Savior. Seek the Savior that you may live. I love what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He says, All who are in Christ are a new creation. So why do we need to be made a new creation? Because we were dead in our trespass and sin. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, right? Verses 1 through 3. We were dead in our trespass and sin, so we had to be what? We had to be made alive together in Christ Jesus. And Christ has done that. When we seek after Christ, guess what we find? Christ! There's never been a man or woman who sought after the Lord that has not found the Lord. God is near to all those who trust in Him, who seek Him. Jesus says, you come near me and I will be near to you. Beloved, let me ask you this morning, are you seeking after Christ? Or might you find yourself in a situation where you're seeking too often and too much and too fast the things of this world, the success of this world, the primacy of this world, the adulation of this world, and you make no time, no effort, you have no energy left to seek after Christ? And instead of being revived as this new creation in Christ, you're, you're torn and you're full of anxiety and fear and worry and dread and doubt. When you find a man or a woman seeking after the world instead of seeking after Christ, you find a person who seemingly lost and they, like a dog, chase their tail, never finding it. Because the world will never allow you to have what you are truly seeking because it cannot give you what you are truly seeking. We seek peace. We seek joy. We seek blessedness. We seek salvation, beloved. And that is only found in the Savior, Jesus Christ. The third thing Amos tells them is to follow the Savior. Verse 14, seek good and not evil that you may live. Seek the good things. And what does it look like to seek the good things? It simply means, Jesus says this in Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26, he says, take up your cross and follow me. When you seek the Savior, that means you're a disciple of the Savior. Wherever Jesus goes, you go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. That's one of Miss Aker's favorite songs. I don't know if it is, but I'm just going to say it is because I feel like if we were singing, she would shout amen to it. <laughs> Beloved, let me ask you, are you seeking after the Savior in your life? Are you following Christ? Many of us, if we're going to be honest, it's not that we've turned away from following Christ. It's just that we've stopped following Christ. Let's, just, let's be honest this morning. It's not that you're running towards the devil. It's just you've been complacent in this situation. 
Love it. If you want to experience the righteousness of God, if you want to know what salvation is, if you want to know the fullness of what Christ has to offer, hear the Savior, seek the Savior, and follow the Savior. As we close this morning, as our team comes, I want to ask you this morning, whose righteousness are you trusting in? Whose righteousness are you trusting in? Because if you're trusting in your own righteousness, if you're trusting what you can build, what you can give, what you can stay away from, it's going to leave you lacking and wanting. You will not receive what you desire to receive. But if you've come to the end of yourself, if you realize you can't do it, if you realize you have nothing to offer, if you realize the glorious gift that has been given to you in Jesus Christ, and you turn to Christ and you say, God, I have nothing. Father, forgive me. Christ, forgive me. Jesus, I trust in you. Guess what you have? Immediately, you have the righteousness of Christ upon you, in you, and through you. And you can live out that righteousness. And there may be those who you say, I've been made one with Christ. I've been forgiven. I'm a Christian. But, beloved, you know you're not hearing the Savior. You're not seeking the Savior. And you're not following the Savior. As Pastor Gene said, if we truly desire to make an impact in DeSoto, in Jefferson County, around the world, if we want to be those men and women who truly change the families and communities we live in, we have to be a people that do not rely on our righteousness, but we rely on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me, please? Father God, thank you so much for the time you've given us this morning. God, as we turn our attention to you this morning, God, we ask that you would be gracious to us. We rejoice in the salvation and we rejoice in the baptism uh, that we saw earlier today. But I know there are people here, God, who need you. I know there are people who are struggling, God. I know there are people who need to confess sin this morning, God. They may need to turn to their husband, to their wife, to their neighbor right now and, and just confess that sin, Lord, to be made right with you. I know there are those, God, who may be complacent in their walk with you, and they're, they're not hearing from you. They're not seeking you, God. They're not following you. God, would you wrench our hearts this morning that we may be a men, that we may be women, that we may be young people, God, who see the glory of Christ and what it can do in our lives, who see the righteousness of Christ as the epitome of everything we could ever want and need in this life. And that we would turn to your righteousness and not trust our righteousness. God, make us righteous this morning in Christ Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name.